Good afternoon. Thanks to all of you for coming. I'm Clay Gillette. I'm the director of the Marin Institute of Urban Management. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the work of the Marin Institute understand that we do applied work with cities and other governments and foundations to try to improve the delivery of municipal services. Our, our uh, function right now ranges from the stakes in the ground work done all over the developing world by Sally Angel and his team to Constantine Contacosta's work with big data to Angela Hawkins' work of doing random control trials to see if small, small changes in the delivery of services can make big differences in the quality of what municipalities are able to do. Uh, we also do a variety of one-off projects. We're doing some projects right now with the uh, teacher's retirement system in New York City and with the city of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. So we cover a large area of uh, attempting to help cities and other governments uh, towards that end, I want to thank and welcome Don Marin, who is with us this afternoon. Don has been extraordinarily generous and kind, not only in his support financially of the Institute, but also in his providing advice to us along the way. Uh, but we're here this afternoon to hear about an economist visiting Burning Man. Um, and it is my distinct honor and privilege to welcome back to the Marin Institute the founding director in its, in its current incarnation, Paul Romer. Paul, of course, uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with. He is here with us at NYU. Um, he was previously uh, the chief economist at the World Bank. Uh, did he do anything else? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, he won the Nobel Prize in economics. <laughs> um, so, the way we're going to run is as follows. Paul is going to introduce us to Burning Man with a few slides. And then Paul and I will have a conversation about Burning Man and its implications for the urban environment. And we'll conduct that conversation for several minutes. And then towards the end, we'll open it up for a little bit of a Q&A. So thank you all for coming. And I'm sure you'll enjoy this presentation as much as I expected. So Paul. Have at it. Great. Okay. So, Nicole, if we could turn the lights down just a touch while I go through the, the pictures. Um, I want to just give you a feel for a, a couple of things about the experience on the ground there. Um, the, the first is just the immensity of the space that um, we're dealing with there. This is dawn on what they call fence day. I'll say more about that in a second. Um, this is a crew which is uh, building, they build nine miles of fence in about three hours. And so it's, it's really an amazing thing to watch on, on fence day. Um, th this is fence, the fence with just the, the metal posts in the ground. Here's once they put the plastic uh, uh, netting up to, to catch the, the trash. Um, here's a shot from uh, up on a hill overlooking where you can see one side of the Pentagon shaped by the fence. This is point one. Uh, this goes off in kind of an easterly direction. You go up to point through uh, point um, two on on this dimension here, and y you know you got to appreciate those two dimensions are the same length. So uh, the view out that way is very compressed by a telephoto lens. Um, this is an illustration of the map that uh, Coyote, who was one of the most interesting people I met there, used to actually put the stakes in the ground after someone else drew this in, in AutoCAD. And you can see how he's actually written in by hand the conversion from the clock numbers, which is how they refer to the streets in, in the, the drawing. But he's using a, a theodolite to survey these in, so he needs to know the, the degrees relative to uh, the 0.5, which is up at the top. Um, I may come back and talk about a little bit about, um, if you can see here, there's a, a funneling in effect to this uh, circle and then a funneling back out here, but no such funnels around this circle. And this one, there's no funnel back out. So one of my puzzles there about these details of the design and the experimentation is, why, uh, why is this one funneling back out, but these, these other ones don't? Um, this is a view, again, from up on the hill uh, two or three days before the start. 
it's a very compressed, um, again, through a telephoto picture of the, the base for the man in the center. And then I think we're looking in on um, the seven o'clock radial. So we're kind of looking up through this street towards the, towards the man here. Um, these are what they call spires that line uh, a kind of a promenade that goes out to the man. So this gives you, again, a sense of the distance. The distance between what looks like the edge, uh, you know, the edge of the camping area and then this open area out to the man, that looks small from this angle, but of course looks big from, from this angle. These spires have a feature I want to allude to, which is revealed by these little hooks at the top. These are uh, theft deterrent devices, as well as architectural features, and I'll explain that in a minute. Um, here's another point about the theft. The sign just says, fellow burners, could you please wait until at least Sunday night, last day of the event, before you steal the, the street signs? Because the street signs are actually very important for getting, uh, getting around. Um, the, they've actually put in, I, yeah, I guess I didn't include it, but there are also some pipes that are marked in somewhat obscure markings that they put next to the intersections so that the emergency vehicles can find out where which intersection they need to get to even when people steal signs as they do. Um, this is a bunch of vehicles waiting in line for the DMV. It takes hours and hours to get your permit to drive on, uh, on the playa. Uh, so um, for those of you who think the Burning Man, uh, the Black Rock City is Libertopia with no rules, and no government, you know, if they have a DMV and if you have to wait hours, I think it counts as a government and rules. Um, and by the way, if your vehicle emits fire, there's a separate line you have to go to to get uh, to get approved and a whole a whole much more complicated application process. Um, this is the temple, which is the thing they burn on the, the very last day. It's just here because I thought it was pretty. Um, and then these are some pictures we took um, from an airplane that show after this is um, it was a Sunday, so the day when the event is about to start, when most of the space has been occupied by, by people coming in. Okay, I think that was the last, the last one. I'll, uh, I'll bring this back up, um, and then we might, we might come back and look at, look at some of these pictures as, as questions come up or in, as the discussion merits. Okay, so I'll sit here. Um, so, Paul, I'd like to begin with just a, a little bit of background to see um, what evolved uh, to lead you to go to Burning Man and to yeah. try to extrapolate from your experience there. Uh, so, first of all, how do you how do you explain your interest in cities? You obviously su see some productivity possibilities yeah. that can be generated in cities that aren't otherwise available. So, can you elaborate on that a little bit? You know, one of the things that's interesting about an exercise this where, where you're dealing with a reporter is they'll ask you questions like, when did you first start getting interested in Burning Man? And, and the reality is I had no idea. I couldn't remember. I went back and checked my email and I found a discussion about uh, going to Burning Man back in 2008. So this is before I came to NYU, before we started the, the Marin Institute. Uh, so uh, as of 2008, Back at that time, I was working with Brandon and Kerry on the kind of Charter Cities initiative, and I had this intuition that uh, Burning Man would be a useful model if somebody asked you, like, could you, could you create a place that's actually a city in, you know, a, a month, and uh, or how how many people could you settle in a month? And I wanted to be able to say, oh, eighty thousand in, in a month. It's it's proven. We know how to do it. But uh, I just knew that in the abstract. I hadn't been there to watch it happen. So there was about three weeks between the first picture I show, showed you of Fence Day and then these pictures where there's about 80,000 people on the, uh, in the city. So uh, I knew that there would be something important as a kind of a demonstration case about how you could build cities quickly if you had to. And why would you want to build a city quickly? What it was that you see the cities being able to do that yeah. other, could not otherwise be done. So the, back in 2007, when I first decided I was going to focus on urbanization, what was very much on my mind, or 
the, the, is the scale of the potential migration flows that we're facing. The estimates from the Gallup uh, organization right now are that 750 million people say they want to leave the country or they would leave the country they live in if they had a chance to go. 160 million of those people say they want to come to the United States. So at that kind of scale, um, none of the discussion we've had about how many people should we take in the United States, how many people should Europe take, I mean, none of that discussion is going to scale to hundreds of millions of people. So I wanted to come up with some kind of alternative that could could potentially respond to the scale, which eventually became this idea of brand new cities of about, say, 10 million people per, per location. You know, if you had 50 of those around the world, then you could accommodate 500 million people. And now you're starting to talk about a scale which is realistic relative to the size of the, the problem. Um, you, you've said that uh, Burning Man illustrates what I think Sally calls his stakes in the ground approach. Yeah. Can you elaborate a little bit on what you mean or what, maybe I, you can elaborate what Sally means by, by that term. Sure. Well, this is what, what Sally means and what I, I learned from, from Sally about this when we came here. I had this just vague instinct that this would be possible and that Burning Man illustrated this. Um, one of the great things about coming to New York and getting to know Sally and uh, Alain Berteau is you learn parts of the history, like the, the grid plan for New York City, which amounted to just staking, here's where Fifth Avenue is going to go, here's how wide it's going to be, here's where all the other streets are going to go. And then, you know, it took almost 100 years to build that out. But just staking the public space, especially the streets and sidewalks in advance, meant that there was all kinds of possibilities for using that public space and in particular meant that the city could support the kind of densities that we have now because there's enough public space for transit and connectivity. So um, the the lesson I, I took away from Sully and Alain was that for any brand new city but also for any expansion of an existing city the single most important thing that a government has to do and can do is to stake the public space, meaning the streets and sidewalks, parks if you can, but stake that space in advance because it's you can never get that public space back if you don't set it aside in the beginning. And if you set it aside in the beginning, you have options for using it in the future that can make the city much more successful. A lot of urban expansion these days ends up with very little road space no possibility of a of an arterial road that a, someone could take a bus down to get from home to work and back and uh it's a, a very important uh priority to both do this in any new city but also to do it in any um expansion that's that's taking place because we'll build in you know in the next several decades we'll build a substantial part of the urban area I think over the next century, we'll build about as much urban area as already exists. And then the, the world will live with that urban area forever. So it's a high, very high priority to get it right. What's great about Burning Man is it does, to a certain extent, uh, there's, there's more to it than just this, but it, to a certain extent, it does show the value of just putting stakes in the ground and then letting people come in and do what they want to do on their on their lots. But you tell them before they come in, don't build your t build a tent on the on the street. In Burning Man, they do it right. They tell you you can't even park a car on the street. You know, streets are much too valuable for for parking. So uh, so it's uh, an illustration of the feasibility of this approach about stakes in the ground that um, Solly has been arguing for and then implementing in both uh, um, Ethiopia and Colombia and then in other places as we, we he and his team spread uh, spread the word. So what you've just said um, reminds me of, of the way you've been talking about the laying out of the grid, and at least in your earliest uh, expression of these ideas, a demarcation of the role of government and the role of the market. So as I understand, at least in your early, in, in your early expression of the idea, government comes in and lays out the grid, and that's necessary because the grid has many of the characteristics of a public good. Right. So one would not expect a market readily to be able to lay out the grid. Yeah. But once the grid has been laid out, the market comes and fills it in. Right. One 
concern I've got about that, and I realize it's a very rudimentary way to present it, but yeah. one of the concern I've got about that is it, it reveals a relatively, um, a, a, a belief in a relatively benign sense of government. But government is itself a collective action problem. If you govern, I don't have to. So it often ends up that those who participate in governance are those who have some interest that is more intense than the average voter or average resident. So do you have a concern that the grid itself will be laid out by a government that decides we're going to govern and create a grid because we have an interest in the grid looking a certain way, which may not, which may deviate from yeah. the shape of a publicly interested grid. Yep. That yep. is, what's the role of politics in laying out the grid? Right. Well, well, one of the things that Sally emphasizes a lot in this process is the laying out part, like the stakes in the ground cost almost nothing. So you're just creating options, you're setting expectations. If it's a badly designed grid, it won't attract very many people, it won't su succeed, but there's also relatively little cost in you know going out and putting those stakes in the ground. On the other hand, if it's a successful grid, and there's a, you gotta think of a successful grid as being a set of things that are kind of on the top of some quadratic. There's a whole lot of variation that probably doesn't make a lot of difference, but you know there's small advantages to getting something that's slightly better. But if as long as it's a grid that's you know basically functional, then there's this possibility that large numbers of people will come, and um, it will it will succeed. Now, now this doesn't remove the risk of or the problem. This doesn't deal with the problem of holding the officials who run the government accountable because they're going to do other things before people show up. Doesn't really matter. People can just choose where to go, but they're going to do other things once people are there. So you still have to solve this problem of finding some way to hold hold people accountable. But but there's there's a lot about some, some kind of libertarian ideology that I either don't understand or if I understand it, I disagree with. But the one element where I think there's some truth is that there is some real value in a check that involves having people leave a place that's that's badly governed. And if you've got a bunch of places where people can go, that becomes a non-trivial check. I mean, the, the thing that holds uh, the people who run the government in Burning Man in check is uh, wanting to keep attracting people every year. They, they actually want to keep making it bigger. They're, they're aiming for 100,000 right now, and only limit is kind of the permit that the BLM uh, gives them. But you know, their ability to keep attracting people every year is partly a function of not, not messing up. So choice, and voting with your feet is a potential accountability mechanism, but it's not the only one. And you know, in any case where we get some value out of a government that has some powers, we're gonna have to figure out some way to make sure that the government actually does its job. But, but I, I think we spend way too much time focusing on what should the government's job be, and not nearly enough on, okay, now that we know what the job is, make the government do its job. And that's where a lot of the problem comes. So it seems you would think that one of the delights of cities is there are many of them. Yep. There's a market for residents. People can exercise an exit option, even if they don't have much in the way of a voting option, a voice option. Yep. And that might provide an accountability mechanism that might not be available with respect to more centralized levels of government. It's easier to move out of New York City to Westchester and still take advantage of New York City than it is to leave the United States if you don't like what's going on here. Yeah, but it does It does depend on a, a generous supply of places to go. And in a, in a place like the United States right now where there's a lot of restrictions on expansion, in fact, in most countries where there's restrictions on expansion, that voting with your feet isn't as effective uh, as it could be because is very hard to get into other places. The cost of the land, the cost of housing in some of the best places is too high. So um, this idea of expanding built urban area by just expanding the size of existing cities and potentially creating entirely new ones is an important part, I think, of creating this pressure to kind of discipline local governments to, to do their jobs well. I want to come back to the, to the idea of, of the effect of regulation or certain, certain kinds of regulation. But to get to that, let me, let me st stick with the grid for a moment. So I wonder whether it's just putting stakes in the ground and, wh or, and whether you're indifferent as to uh, the shape of the grid. This obviously looks quite different from the commissioner's 1811 yeah. plan. Yeah. Um, a 
once you lay out a grid, it could accommodate Jane Jacobs, it, it could accommodate Le Corbusier, and you have very, very different looking cities. Yeah. So I wonder whether government or whether what the mechanism should be for deciding among the possibilities, for, mm. because that might have significant effects on the success of the city. So I think we understand the role that network effects and agglomeration economies play in the success of cities, and therefore you might want a grid that um, generates um, an optimal number of interactions mm -hmm. so that you can maximize those agglomeration economies. Yeah. Um, you might want a grid that encourages diversity of those interactions. You might want mixed uses. So you get conversations among people who are residents, people who are businessmen. What, what how, how do you do, how do you decide what the design or who should decide might be the better yeah. question. Yeah. What the grid should look like, given that your choice of the grid is going to have consequences. Yeah. I think there are some simple principles, like one that I learned from Solly was make sure that everybody lives within half a kilometer of uh, an arterial road that could have a bus line running up and down it. Now, that's a kind of a rule of thumb, you know, inferred from experience around the world about how far people will walk. But there are some principles like that. So you got to have arterials. You got to think of them as being the key for flow out throughout the whole the whole city. You want people to be able to walk or have some other solution. If you're going to use like subway type arterials, then you're going to have to have a, a different solution than walking to handle the the last mile problem from getting from your house to the the, the subway station. So there's some general constraints. Beyond that, I think there's a lot of well, as I said, a lot of the variations, if you look at uh, block sizes in the United States, is probably somewhere at the top of the, you know, the, the, the top of a, a quadratic. So there's small changes. Portland has very square blocks. New York City has these very long, narrow ones. Portland has a very high fraction of land in uh, public space because of its, its square blocks. It, it, the Portland range is probably suboptimal, but you know, it's not that, it's not that bad. You know, and, and a lot of the other details emerge, I think, from, from trial and error. It's very hard to predict exactly how one of these things is going to work out. So you, you don't want to assume, like, just because you've got a grid which seems functional, somehow it's optimal and the market handles everything else from that. The, the beauty of, of Burning Man as a test bed is they try it every year and they make those changes, like that little funnel I was showing you. You can then experiment with those and see what difference it, it makes. The thing that was behind that experimentation is they were trying to create city centers that were in the interior um, so that people could go nearby and get some of the basics. So you didn't all have to come back to center camp, which is at the bottom of the circle and where the, the, the central, it's really the central business district that naturally emerges. They were trying to create like sub, you know, sub city centers if you're familiar with the peninsula uh, between San Francisco and San Jose, you can see what it's like to have these sub-centers that are a historical legacy of train stops. They're trying to create these um, artificially, and they did it by creating those plazas. This year, they actually shrunk the size of the plazas because the traffic was moving too fast in, inside the plaza. Part of why it was good to go there is somebody told me, well, we shrank it to slow the traffic down, and I said, well, I mean, how many cars are there? He said, no, 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 not the cars, the bicycles. <laughs> the bicycles are going too fast. So they shrank the pauses. They also, on that funnel that goes out, they moved two key functions, the ranger station and the basically the, the, the emergency medical team out of the circle one block away. But they wanted those stations to be vis visible from the circle. By moving the rangers and the EMTs out of the circle, they got some more real estate that they could use for creating small businesses that would, you know, or like these small kind of activities that people will set up that makes the circle more vibrant. The other thing they did is they moved um, the ice. The one thing they, one of the two things, they sell two things there at, at, at Burning Man, coffee and ice. So like the two, the two essentials of, of, of life. So they moved some of the ice stations towards those uh, plazas on the interior because they wanted to avoid the current tendency, which is sort of the default tendency, which was to use the, the what they call the esplanade, which faces out towards the men. 
they didn't want that to always be the the center of all the activity because then it makes it disadvantageous to be so far away from the uh, on the kind of the they use alf the alphabet for, for those streets so out on the k and l streets that are a long way away from the, the esplanade so, so you sort of describe an interesting evolutionary process that the ability to learn and to adapt um, I, I want to tie that back to something you said a moment ago about regulation. So yeah. as I understand it, I've never had the pleasure of going. Um, I might cure that and yeah. that defect in my character in the future. Um, but um, as I understand it, Burning Man uh, accommodates lots of different uses. There are obviously residential uses, there's art installations, there's music. Um, some of these are incompatible with each other. Oh, yeah. So how does Burning Man deal with the, the risk of incompatible uses uh, they, they have a central planner so if you if you have a camp I'm gonna have kids camp for example you have to tell them we're gonna do kids camp they approve you if you know if, if you if it's the first time or if you've had done it before they'll and you've, you know just been a success they'll approve you but they decide where kids camp goes you don't get to pick where your your, your camp is so it's it's a little more than zoning they just call it placement and it was funny to discover the places at which I was bumping up against the constraint where they wouldn't tell me and the, this reporter from the Times, Emily. Um, it was very interesting what they kept secret. Until the day, actually really the moment we left, we left the beginning of the event, which is Monday morning at dawn. Until that point, they would not show us the map about where all the camps were because this is a very contentious thing. And they're even moving some of those camps up to the last minute. So they don't want the people who have camp, whatever, you know, the kids camp to come start occupying space until they've finally decided where, where kids camp is going to be. So that was the one thing they would not let us see. Um, they let us see the previous year's map of which camps were where, but they wouldn't let us see the new map because they, they didn't want to make that public until the, the event actually uh, actually starts. Fascinating. And, and they use the camps to try and decide where the loud music goes, where the kids go, where the kind of, they don't call it this, but everybody calls it the, the red light district goes. And so they, they group activities in a way that um, seems to get the benefits of synergy and avoid some of the, the, the spillovers. So one of the, one of the lessons about going there was this idea of stakes in the ground and then let things happen. This is a pretty good idea. But then you learn in this city, there's a lot more government going on and so it's, it's more than zoning, it's actually, you know, placement. There are some areas towards the back. If you look in the lower left corner, there's some places that aren't very filled in yet. You can just go grab free space in, in those areas. They don't assign you particular spots. So if you don't have a camp that you've applied in advance to place someplace, um, you, there is a certain amount of just freedom you've got about where, where you can go. But they're actually quite, you know, quite, uh, quite interventionist about where you know where the different camps go, and the other thing also is is that if you if you if you mess up um, in some way, your camp can get just you know kicked out. You, you can't you may not get invited back sure. the, the following year, um, or if, or if even if you do something which just sort of violates the the, the culture, um, there's a there's one particular camp that people felt like kind of like sort of broke the rules and that was that camp was all the way out at so you go up to two o'clock and k about as far away as you can get from all the action that camp got placed at two and k uh this this year so uh, so you know they, they as one of the as one of the people from the organization said um you know we gotta have a way to squeeze them so uh so that moving you to two and k is a way to squeeze somebody so there's a shunning there's a shunning principle that, that you well no no say. shunning is when they don't let you in that's what the fence is right, about more shaming but inside you know? inside the place inside the inside the you know the the city there's still placement so you can get a bad placement or you can get told nope you're not you're not welcome you can't come here so reputation matters yeah but you use you use the term zoning and obviously in um cities with which we're, we may be more familiar we may think it was more traditional uh zoning is a mechanism for avoiding contentiousness between uh, yeah. between incompatible uses but at the same time you alluded before to how regulation including zoning might present might provide a, a might generate a cap on growth and on development um so what can we learn about zoning from what happens at burning man yeah um 
I, I think there's, there's general principles I talked about, say like so such, this is how far people will walk, for example, to a city center. You can learn something about those. Um, you can probably learn a lot about what a more bike centric city is like, because it is very bike centric right now. Um, I, I think you'd want to be careful about overgeneralizing from the specifics here, like this very intensive placement process, which kind of goes beyond zoning. It's just, they just figure out where all the big camps go. This can work partly because they, they do it afresh every year, so that as things change, they can adapt. Most zoning systems in most cities that can't you know, rebuild themselves every year, I think are, much, are inherently much more inflexible. So you'd, I think you'd be, want to be careful about being as directive about where things happen with a traditional city with its zoning as, as, they, are, as they are there. But you can still learn some things about kind of both what sorts of activities uh, complement each other, what kinds you want to you want to keep separate. So it's the I think it's the general principles that that will emerge, and also I think this point that even if you have a functional grid or a kind of a given grid, it's not necessarily the case that what emerges will be optimal. It may be worth some intervention to try and create like sub centers, and those might be valuable if they emerge, but they might not uh, emerge and. Like I said, in the peninsula, we got them just by accident because there was uh, there were train stops before it before it developed. Uh, peninsula in San Francisco Bay Area. Um, in a lot of cities, you didn't have that accident, and the market on on its own may not develop the sub centers that would actually be you know valuable if you could get them started. I want to shift gears a little bit to something you've alluded to, and that is uh, some of the some of the unique characteristics of Burning Man. Primarily, it gets to redo itself every year yeah. and that's uh that's a, a nice um characteristic that built environments don't enjoy so to the extent that you're looking at burning man as an exemplar of what cities might look like and what cities might do what could happen in the burning man environment what is what is the the consequence of the fact that it reinvents itself every yeah. year that might lead us to have some new ideas for cities that are either already built or once built mm -hmm. are going to be more difficult to change? Well, they have data about things like the number of incidents that surface that require intervention by what they call the rangers. That's their kind of volunteer police force. They've got data on that and they've been tracking this both as a fun function of the total scale of the population and the density and have some conjectures about you know how at, at some point density gets high enough that the the friction start to get more intense. Uh, I think even more interesting than studying that data would be I, I want to take 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 Angela out and introduce everybody in the Burning Man org to, to Angela because they're already running these little experiments but just not quite as systematic about kind of collecting the data as they could be. And some of these experiments I think could be relevant uh, in the sense that they identify these general principles. Um, the rangers right now um, don't have the ability to like physically incapacitate somebody and then take them off scene. There are officers from the BLM and some from the sheriff's department for the county who are around. They carry guns. They could you know incapacitate or arrest somebody if they had to. The Burning Man Org is contemplating having teams that could actually do some of that incapacitation themselves. They're thinking about how to do that though because they like the fact that when a ranger comes to to people who are in a in a dispute, often it's basically a boundary dispute, you know, like you know, you, you your your camp is spilling into my camp and you know, people will sometimes go out and like pull up the flags that mark where the different camps could be and then move them over and so you know, people are going to be people. Uh this steal the signs. Uh, I'll tell you why the the spires that they steal that the pyres the spires are trying to stop. Um, but when the ranger comes up and says, uh, "Listen," uh, tries to solve the debut, he says, "Listen, I'm I'm a burner just like you, I, and I've got no authority here, but I'm I'm just here to try and be helpful, and let me let me see if I can help." And they think that that kind of identification is a good way to achieve what I think in other departments you'd call the, the community policing. They're asking themselves whether they should give the rangers this ability to just physically, you know, like handcuff or you know tie up or put a net or something around somebody if, if that person's being dangerous to him or herself or dangerous to other people. Um, 
and and like these things happen. There was there's a story about you know somebody swinging a sledgehammer, you know, ready to go out and you know get even for some grievance this person was mad about. So again, you know, people are going to be people. Um, the alternative to giving that kind of power to the rangers would be to create a different team that you could call in to incapacitate or remove somebody from the scene. And you know, there's some delays involved in that, but you know, there might actually be some value in preserving this kind of status of you know, no special authority um, uh, for, the, for the rangers in this, this other team. So um, I think it would be a beautiful experiment to run is figure out one year do one way, one the other way, or parts of the camp do, in parts of the city do one versus the other. And then use that to inform questions about how we might try and implement um, community policing in, uh, in the United States. Um, it is a place where the rules are you can't bring in guns. They search cars, you know, kind of intrusively when you're coming in, but probably not intrusively enough to catch every single gun that, that comes in. But the presumption is that when, you know, the rangers come on a dispute, they're not likely to get shot. So they don't, you know, they don't carry any, they don't carry weapons, they don't wear body armor and so forth. Um, so it's not, again, it's not clear how you translate that into a context where you do have a lot of guns. It might tell you something about what it would be like if we didn't have a lot of guns in some cities. But either way, I think we could learn a lot about, you know, the value of uh, putting all of these responsibilities on a single set of, you know, kind of members of the force versus having some division of labor and uh, more of this sense that, the, you know, the, the people you see most often are people there who actually kind of are on your side. They're there to help help you. So. Uh, It'd be all about policing. It'd be the first set of experiments I'd try and uh, get them to so, pursue. So I love the idea of using Burning Man as a base for experimentation of policies that might be then deployed in, in more traditional cities. Yeah. But there's an, there's an assumption uh, built into that, that uh, belief. And I wonder if you just comment on the assumption. Yeah. And the assumption is that uh, Burning Man and what goes on at Burning Man and the people attracted to Burning Man are uh, simply proxies for, as you say, people are people, that yeah. people, uh, people live in cities generally. Right. That there's not a self-selection effect with respect to who attends Burning Man that would skew the results that Andrew will find when she goes out there. Yep. So why wouldn't we believe that yeah. given the characteristics of Burning Man, given its, its, uh, its history, given its, um, its role in the popular press, um, why wouldn't we believe that the people who attend Burning Man, that maybe more communitarian, which would mean the ability to say, hey, I'm a burner just like you, has yeah. greater effect than, um, than the friendly officer who, uh, who yeah. approaches me on, on Fifth Avenue and says, I'm just a New Yorker, just like you. Yeah. I, I just wonder whether yeah. what, what you think about the assumption that, uh, that what we would find at Burning Man is yeah. sufficiently translatable to more what happens in more traditional cities. Yeah, so I think it, it helps to have in mind like two abstract, uh, very distinct models. The world is inevitably going to be some mixture of those two. But one of these models is the model of types. There are good people, there are bad people, and uh, Burning Man succeeds because bad people don't come. The other model is everybody's basically the same, or every population has a representative distribution of people. And the circumstances, the context that you create have a big influence on whether people behave well or in a socially positive way or people behave badly. I think there's lots of evidence from Burning Man that that second model is the dominant force that's in play. And it's very important to talk about this because there is this group of libertarians, whatever the hell libertarian means, who say that Burning Man is libertopia and yay, this is what we should do everywhere. But they're, they're struggling with how to explain how this works. And they're increasingly kind of falling back on the fact they, they know that their prescription for, you know, the, for the world is not going to work. And uh, so they're trying to reconcile how it works at Burning Man. And they say, oh, well, it's just because you're selecting the right people. You get the right people, then, okay, we can have a libertarian, you know, libertopia. And you don't have to listen for very long to realize that in, the racism is right below the surface in this conversation. There's a there's a audio tape you can listen to of a podcast of a Cato Institute session, a bunch of libertarians talking about uh, Burning Man. 
and nobody on the panel says it, but somebody from the audience says, well, isn't it just because it's white people? So, you know, I mean, it's, it's really incredibly transparent how much this is, these people have the type model, map that type model onto race and, uh, and ethnicity. But the reason I kept emphasizing people steal street signs, uh, people, uh, they, there's another thing they steal, they put lanterns on those promenades that go out to the Burning Man, little uh, kerosene lanterns, and people love souvenirs. They used to steal the lanterns every year. They put labels on them the next year saying, you know, property of Burning Man organization. People stole more of those. So, okay, all right, all right, that didn't work. <laughs> so they built these spires that have these hooks and you can't get the lantern off of a spire without knocking the whole spire down, which you could do. They're just, they're just wooden things. You, you could knock them down. But the kind of the visibility uh, and the kind of the destructiveness of knocking down kind of substantially reduced the, the, the theft of the, of the lanterns. So, you know, people, people will steal the street signs. You, you saw how one neighborhood tried to, the Burning Man Org basically just threw in the towel on street signs. I mean, by the way, this organization, when they build this city, they have a sign shop. <laughs> you know, it's like, they have to plan all of this stuff. So you gotta have street signs to mark everything. You have a sign shop that builds the street signs. They just figure people are gonna steal the street signs. So they made these plastic pipes with, you know, intelligible, but, you know, less interesting to steal markings so that the emergency responders could always find out which intersection they were at. But, um, you know, you can see how this one neighborhood, that sign I showed you, people were trying to put pressure on others. Don't, you know, don't steal the street signs, at least until the, the end, of, end of the event. And if you go back to the early history, um, we should talk about the fence to just show how much difference the fence made in terms of the behaviors they saw at Burning Man. So you see lots of small changes and some very big ones that all changed the nature of the interaction. So I'm, I'm absolutely per per persuaded that the same people in a very different situation could you know, basically have a riot, could engage in all kinds of terrible predatory behavior in the, the context and the social norms that are created by this context uh, are the key to creating an outcome that, that people really enjoy. So I want to let you talk about the fence because I know you like the idea of the fence. So what do you like about the fence? What's the importance yeah. of the well, fence? And the, what does the, it do? Well, basically the fence, I got to show you a picture. A fence defines who's in the community and who's not. And if you don't have a fence, um, you, can't, uh, you can't kick anybody out of the community. So the, the moment where this really struck me was when I was reading an interview of one of the key people in developing Burning Man, where he talked about, like, why is it a pentagon for the fence? Everything else is a circle. You know, they could, they could build a circular fence just as easily as they build a pentagon. Reason they made a pentagon was that they wanted to be able to put somebody with night vision goggles at each of the five points and then watch for anybody trying to sneak in or out over the fence during the, the, the course of the event. I mean, the fence, they call it the trash fence. And, and fence day is this almost religious day where everybody stops everything and they, they build the fence. But the fence is not just about trash. It's not mainly about trash. The fence defines who's in and who's not. And they watch that fence very carefully. If you try to sneak in over the fence, you're going to have a whole lot of very angry and aggressive people descend on, swarm on you before you even get close if you're coming in from the outside. And they're going to stop you, you know, physically from, uh, from, from coming in. They also will stop you if you try to go out because they're worried about people getting, getting lost out there. But um, the, the fence was the response to the problems that started emerging when they, they'd been doubling every year and they were in around the range of going from 5,000 people to 10,000 people. In the periphery outside of the main area, they started to get all kinds of very dangerous behavior. They had um, these drive-by shooting galleries where cars would go by with their lights off in the dark and shoot guns at you know things that people would set up uh, uh, to, to shoot at. They, um, they were there were, you know, I don't know if it was spontaneous or organized games of chicken where vehicles with their lights off would, you know, kind of threaten to, to crash into each other. And one guy on a motorcycle playing chicken with a truck got his head, he got decapitated, he got his head cut off. So, you know, there was the, the BLM basically kicked them off of this area and said, you can't come back next year because uh, too much bad stuff has happened. They all said somebody got, there was a vehicle that drove over some people in, 
um, sleeping bags. I don't know if they were killed or badly hurt, but this is, so part of the response was we got to have the streets and we got to have the grid. But the other thing, when they got back on the playa, they were off for a year, they got back on the playa, they designed the streets and the grid, but they also instituted defense and started making it clear that there, there's an organization, essentially a government, that decides who gets in and who doesn't. And the ultimate sanction is that you won't be let back in if you, if you be behave badly enough. There's one person, every time I asked about this, there's one person where they would say, oh yeah, you know, like Matt Smith, yeah. Everybody knows about Matt Smith. Matt Smith's not allowed back in anymore. So they, they can even tell you the name of, you know, Matt and, and you know, what he, what he did to not get allowed back in. So, I, and I think this is, this, this mapped exactly onto something I've been thinking about in science, which is how does science work? How do we make sure that people behave according to some set of rules so that we make progress towards the truth? And the one thing that we have as a tool in science is you just kick people out. If they, they commit fraud, they make up some data, they, they falsify, they mislead, you just ex excommunicate them in this kind of virtual sense. And you just never, never talk to them. They never get a job. They, nobody will listen to them. And uh, um, I think this potential enforcement mechanism is a very critical part of the, uh, the mechanism that undergirds the social pressures, which then create incentives for everybody to, to behave well. So, uh, but I mean, the fence here, they, I mean, it's, it's not just night vision goggles. One of the other places they wouldn't let me go is there's a radar station where they've got radar and a control tower where they can, they scan the whole desert and they watch for anybody coming in from, uh, from all different directions. And if you're old enough like me to remember the kind of the gangs that used to invade en masse uh, rock concerts from like the, the, the late 60s and 70s, you know, that you gotta, you gotta establish this very strong precedent that this will never work. You try and rush the fence, you'll, it won't work. It doesn't matter how many people you bring because if there's even a possibility it'll work, enough people will show up, they'll rush it. And then, you know, you got, you got chaos on their hand, on your hands. So the, 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 the badass team at, at uh, Burning Man is what they call a uh, gate perimeter and exodus. And uh, those are the people you don't want to, you don't want to mess with much more than the, uh, the Rangers. So uh, I want to, I want to extrapolate from the physical fence which is used as a means of demarcating and defining the community to virtual or non-physical fences used by more traditional cities. So cities have boundaries, but typically today we're not building walled cities, we're not building fences around cities, maybe yep. around countries, but not around cities. Yep. How do cities establish through a virtual fence some demarcation or definition of who's a member of the community and who's not? Yeah. And to the extent that cities do that, does that give you pause about the fence, about any fencing? Because it's possible that membership will be defined in invidious ways. Sure. Well, Manhattan, certainly, there's a sense that the way Manhattan has decided to define itself, the way it's filling in its grid, mm -hmm. um, discriminates significantly on the basis of wealth. Yeah. So can you talk to us a bit about yeah. um, not only the upside of the fence, but how cities build non-physical fences and the risks entailed in yeah. creating such fences. So, so I, uh, the first point is that the fence and the ability to exclude is essential for maintaining some sense of uh, kind of a positive equilibrium in the interior. But as you say, the, the kind of the ability to exclude can actually, if you think about a game played by many different cities, lead to an equilibrium between cities that's suboptimal. So if you've got a nation that's trying to govern a bunch of cities, if people at the level of the nation want to reduce income inequality, but if each city wants to address its, you know, its fiscal challenges by only letting in rich people, then you've got a conflict between what you want for the nation as a whole and what each, what each city wants. And you know, nations can make this and do make this worse by saying, oh yeah, all those transfer mechanisms we want to have, um, it's, it's, it's a responsibility of each of these cities. So if you happen to do what we really want you to do, which is let poor people in, yeah, you're going to incur, everybody who's there is going to incur a big budget, you know, hit to kind of provide the transfer services to more people who come. So I think it's worth thinking about the design of the system within which cities would compete. And in, in sort of a system of fiscal federalism, 
is a really bad idea to impose transfers on local governments. You should centralize the transfers to the, to the national, the federal level, and then kind of have the money follow the people to at least, you know, diminish what would otherwise, what, you know, in fact does create these strong incentives for each city to try and include, uh, exclude the poor. So I think the biggest dimension along which this exclusion happens right now is, is basically economic. Mm -hmm. I think there's some, and historically there have been periods where it's, you know, racial and ethnic as well. But I think, um, you know, all of those things could be addressed by some national uh, commitment that disallows or, or disincentivizes uh, the kind of discrimination along racial, ethnic, ethnic and, um, and economic grounds. And then you can still have cities that can kick an individual out for misbehaving, but yet still a group of cities that are um, actively competing, making room for you know, poor people to, to move in. So I want to leave a little time for questions from the audience, yeah. but um, I want to finish up with a, little, with a couple of just general questions about how you think we, meaning our society, are doing with cities. So you started out by talking about your interest being generated by, your interest in cities being generated by the, the migration to cities, and you were wondering what, what can we do with uh, the possibility of building large cities, yeah. new cities that would accommodate this influx. Yeah. So if we're seeing that anywhere, we're, we're seeing it, I take it, in China. China building cities at some remarkable rate. Uh, cities yeah. built four millions of people. Um, perhaps ending up as ghost cities, mm -hmm. and people are not yet moving in there. Uh, if there were an opportunity to build a city from scratch, it sounds like China is attempting to do that. W what's your view of, of the China project to this day, to this point? Uh, well, one thing, um, I remember a TV uh, segment that where somebody went out to um, Dulles Airport right after it was built and said, look, this is a ghost airport. It's opened up and there's nobody here. So, you know, there's a ghost airports, you know, disaster, overinvestment, you know. It's a really easy story to, to run with when something opens up. It, it's, it's rarely actually true. So I, I, I think you should be very skeptical of most of the stuff you hear about um, ghost cities in China. And also just remember that this is a country which is only about half urbanized. So um, they still got a long way to go. So there can't be too much urban floor space total in China. Maybe there's some that's in the wrong place, but uh, um, I, it can't be too much in total. Um, I, and interestingly, I don't think China is actually building any new cities right now. I mean, there's there've been a few conversations I've been in where, where people have kind of speculated about whether this might be a good thing to do, but um, probably based on the success they had with Shenzhen, which really did start out from, from scratch. Um, the thing, though, that I, and, and by the way, I've been, I've been trying to, when I go to China, I tell everybody I can uh, to try and think about this idea of changing the transfer system to create more incentives for each city to, to recruit people who have uh, basically low income, low levels of, of education. And I think this is ultimately going to have to be the way they, they undertake this reform of this hukou system that they, they have. But, but I think the real future that we could start to see shaping up is, is China's trying to encourage all this spending on Belt and Road Initiative that involves big expenditure on ports, big expenditure on rail, and maybe road links between cities. And as we know, um, you can never pay for you know, transport by charging people fares and, and fees. So the only way you ever pay for transport is by uh, gains in the value of the real estate. So I think eventually China is going to have to be developing big cities, trying to capture gains in the value of the real estate from those, those cities so that either they, if they're financing it, or the local governments who are financing it can pay for all this infrastructure they're, they're building. So you know, you could imagine a future in which China is building new cities that could attract some of these hundreds of millions of people who want to get to some place where they can get a job and be safe and their kids can go to school. Um, you could also imagine the U.S. doing the same thing. And, you know, that kind of competition in the future between, you know, China and the United States, which are trying to create cities that uh, compete by attracting more people. You want to be the, the place where lots of people want to go because that's how you get the gains and the value and that's how you succeed. That would be a very good path for competition between the United States and China to go down. So... Um, uh, I think it's it's conceivable that it'll go that way instead of just 
competing by more aircraft carriers and more missiles to kill the aircraft carriers, which is kind of the path we're on right now. But um, but I think it will take some you know some discussion about for both of these entities to kind of see that this is really possible, that this makes economic sense. The cities can not only pay for themselves, but can generate gains that can actually pay for the other investments that um, they're making. So it would be a good thing to try and steer competition between these two big powers in, in that direction. Uh, so um, you like cities. I like cities. I'm going to make a, take a wild guess that most people in this room like cities. Yeah. But Americans seem to have had, throughout our history, this love-hate relationship with cities. Jefferson yeah. hated cities. They've been vilified as places of crime and corruption throughout American history. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt seems to start out as a reformer by pointing out all the evils of New York City. Um, today, many people see them as focal points of creativity and productivity. But the very density that we celebrate is often viewed by others as um, places of dirt and instability. Yeah. So how do you capture the benefits of density while reducing what may be its inevitable costs? Well, I think, I think one, of the, tell us yeah. about well, one of the things I, I think it tells you is you really do need some kind of government, and including something that's like running the DMV and all of the other kinds of functions that, that take some regulation to keep everybody safe, to make sure things work uh, well together. Um, you need a government that can do those things and you need people who force the government to do that, who insist that the government do its job. And I think one of the worst consequences of the kind of intellectual trajectory of the last several decades, led by economists, but also of kind of the political theorists on this libertarian sort of uh, end of this uh, discussion. I think one of the worst consequences is that every time they say, well, we got to just get the government off our backs, what that does is basically give government a free pass to not do its job. And so what we need to be saying is not get the government off our backs, but it's like make the government do its job and do it well. And we'll leave if it doesn't, or we'll kick people out if we can if it doesn't. But there's a job to be done. And things like crime, crime is just, just that just a demonstration that the government is not doing its job. Um, uh, that who who wrote with Wilson about um, broken windows? Oh. Kelling. Kelling, yeah. Kelling once said, and I don't know if he ever wrote this down, but what what did they do? Right, do what do they do in New York City to get the crime rate down? They made the police department do their job. You know, I mean, it, it's it's you know, it's really in some sense as, as simple as that. Uh, so and there are things like you know manpower and allocation, but high crime, like crime in Chicago, is a sign that police are just not doing their job. And uh, so New York is a sign that police are doing their job a lot better than they they used to. And I think we should um, in insist on the the government do its job. And, and by the way, Ronald Reagan was not a libertarian. He was not a small government guy. I mean. If he was a real libertarian, when the air traffic controllers said, we're gonna go on strike, he would have said, woo hoo, let's just get rid of air traffic control and then we'll have libertarian skies. And that wasn't what he said. <laughs> it's like, you guys gotta do your job and I'm gonna fire you if you don't do your job. So there's been all of this discussion as if you know there was one kind of thing that was going on. But uh, I mean, the reality is, is that things like better policing you know, kind of the, 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 the kind of the pullback from these really kind of extortionary kind of threats. These were all signs that people said, OK, the government's got to do its job. And, and I think that's really got to be the message going forward, because, you know, to link this to my earlier work, um, you know, no society is going to make progress unless they've got a government that does its job. So technology can be great, but without a government, you know, you're going to have things like falling life expectancy. Oh, and then where would we ever see that?